<laughs> this is a scary test, but let's get it done. It's physics, math, and engineering. Machine it, draft it, build it, test it, break it. Every time something new gets built, the entire world advances. Laying in bed at night, it's designing new parts, designing new suspension, designing new wings. Hello, all of you who are just joining in. I'm Mike Patey. I like to build wild aircraft. This is Scrappy, a bunch of airplanes put together, crazy horsepower, crazy suspension. Today, we're going to do something a little wild. It never makes me nervous. I'm going to put in a big old parachute. That's not the nervous part. I'm going to set up a rock and explode the top of this aircraft off and do a test to see how this can work. It's a parachute to lower the whole aircraft if there was a real significant problem and it couldn't be landed. So we got a lot to show you, some friends to introduce that none of you have met before that helped me build my airplanes. Let's get started. Back to work. I'm opening up my latest addition to Scrappy. VRS chutes, there's my ballistic cable. I'm so excited. Rocket and, oh my gosh, I'm gonna make a mess. My full aircraft parachute. This is the same size chute. It brings down a Cirrus. Woohoo! <laughs> up, up. Safety first. Let's get it installed. Back to work. 65 pounds, let's round the way up. 70 pounds max. Small price to pay. Hey guys, all right, so I'm getting the straps. I actually just got them bolted onto the parachute for the test. This is the center strap. It's much shorter, but it hooks near the back of the plane. And these go way up to the front. What was really fun about setting up and designing the parachute for Scrappy was all the math and physics that go into sizing the chute, the length of the straps, where they attach, and the structural loads that those attach points have to hold. And it was really fun because it, it went through every aspect, descent rates, feet per minute, um, loads, stress loads, shock loads, impact loads, compression loads on gear, and it was just, going through each one step by step and building a little packet on each one and then bringing them all together was really fun. And some of the little things that made it so fun was just the length of the straps and where they're located. And what's cool about that is you've got to obviously get the center of gravity under the chute so the plane comes down correctly, but it's more than that. It's making sure that the length of each strap makes the tires impact the ground the way you want to reduce the stress loads on your back, your body, and maximize the suspension travel of the gear that you've got on that aircraft. So let me go through that really quick. It's kind of cool. So on a typical aircraft, you might have three to six inches of travel kind of on the high end. Um, Cubs, eight-ish range. And so Scrappy be having over 20 on the front, 13 plus on the back, kind of really opened up the envelope of what we can do with Scrappy and give it a really comfortable landing attitude because both the front and the back of the plane has so much absorption. So on Scrappy, I also needed to decide what sink rate we wanted the aircraft to do. And can I get the sink rate low enough that the gear could handle the impact? Um, typically, that doesn't happen. Typically, when you come down with an airplane, it's just about saving your life and survivability, minimizing the damage to self at full sacrifice of the aircraft. Makes perfect sense. But is it possible to achieve, save the plane and the individuals? And that was the goal we wanted to go after. So, on the straps, we set up the impact load to bring the plane down fairly flat. What that actually does on Scrappy is it makes the front tires contact first where there's lots of soft absorption, quite a bit. And while that's just beginning to absorb, it will slightly tip only a few degrees the aircraft down, make the secondary impact on the tail, and as the tail starts to compress, it retransfers the load to the front and they even up and come down together. So it would basically be touch, touch, 
fold down with all the suspension at once. Partial compression on 20 inches, bringing it down, touch on a 13 inch travel on the back, and then those two travel together the last 13 inches. So it was really cool kind of going through that sequence. We mapped it all out on the computer, mapped, all, mapped out all the points. Then there was this other really cool part, and thank goodness to BRS, they've been doing this forever, and they make such awesome shoes. They're what's in Cirrus. Uh, Scrappy actually has the same parachute that's in a Cirrus. They have lots of different sizes, and they're all labeled with numbers, and then they have a weight load that that parachute can carry, and it's a wide range. That range alters the feet per second FPS that the airplane's gonna come down, and then that results in what kind of G-loading impact on the ground with the relative travel of the gear on that airplane. So putting that all into consideration, we mapped it out with BRS and went through calculations and, and um, a lot of it was just fun to do on my own and then build everything around what I wanted and then cross check it with the guys at BRS and they're just amazing, it's fantastic. So here's what we went for. I went for a larger chute than what this size plane actually needs and there's a couple reasons for that. At some point I'm gonna put it on floats so I wanted to make sure I had a little more weight for those floats, some really long range tanks for all over Alaska. So you need to size the chute to match empty weight and gross weight. That will give you a feet per second sink rate at zero draft of up or down draft thermals if there's storms in the area. So you use that as a baseline then it adjusts for any thermal calculations to make sure you're okay. Here's what's cool. A typical aircraft, you wanna keep it in the 28, 32, 34, 35 feet per second range, somewhere in there, depending on the aircraft. Um, more travel can handle higher sink rates on the suspension, and obviously less travel suspension has to have a lower sink rate. Travel um, on Scrappy, I wanted to get the biggest chute that wouldn't blow away in a supercell cumulus nimbus with a couple thousand foot updrafts. So the likelihood of actually um, being in a cell, well, first of all, I need to not make that mistake and <laughs> mess with the thunderstorm. So let's not go there. <laughs> but you could have a chute so big that if you flew into the wrong storm, I mean a super storm, and you pulled the chute, you, you literally would go up, not down which would be for a really interesting ride. So what I did is I, I wanted to find out what is the slowest sink rate that keeps you in the safety factor of updrafts so the plane can still come down and not go up. And that low end range is in the 24, 25 feet per second, which is about eight to 10 feet per second uh, slower than the max range that you want to impact because of the damage that does on the body. So I took it to the low end with a bigger chute and then put crazy suspension on it. Why? Because I wanted to try and accomplish something that maybe hasn't been done. At least I'm unaware of it. And that is, can we pull a parachute in an aircraft and come down slow enough and soft enough with enough travel that you do no damage to an aircraft? Well, we hope so, and <laughs> that was my goal. So um, I likely will never find out. So for those of you who are gonna ask me to go over the salt flats and pull the chute just to see, <laughs> no, I'm not doing it. But if I can't find a place to land, we're gonna give it a shot. So anyway, that's a lot of, a lot of silliness talking about that. I could have gone into a whole lot more detail. It's just super exciting to play with everything it takes to engineer a parachute into an aircraft. Oh, those of you who might wanna know, can you put a parachute in this aircraft or that aircraft? Um, there's a lot of certified aircraft that BRS has already gone through the process, so you can add a parachute to it. Um, and then in experimental, it opens up a huge envelope. So if you're curious, check out BRS parachutes. They were so good to me and, and really helped me through the process and just made it an absolute blast. So we're gonna put it in, we're gonna shoot it off, We'll see how it goes. Um, 
The test parachute is actually noosed at the bottom. So it's got a, a, a ring on it so the chute actually can't open. And all we're testing is the top blown off the plane, pull this parachute out, drag it up to altitude and get the chute out of the bag um, and full extended. That's success. But the actual chute will be tied because the last thing we want to do on a uh, painted aircraft is um, have a 20 knot wind come up out of a surprise and open the chute up and start dragging Scrappy across the ground and, and hopefully just rolling and not tipping it. But um, so it's going to be necked off. We're going to get it installed, get it done, and then we'll get a brand new chute, not a test chute, that will be wrapped, never used, not a test uh, cell that's been up and down and we're gonna uh, install that permanently into Scrappy. So we have a lot to do, I'm super excited. I uh, hope you don't mind my long-winded description of what we had to do to figure it out. It was really, really fun for me. So I hope you enjoy this rocket launch. Let's get back to work. All right, so this is the first trial of putting the parachute in the box I made off of schematics. So, better fit. <laughs> or I have a lot more work to do. That works. <laughs> okay guys, I'm playing with pink foam. It's a pretty cool part, huh? I'm putting my rocket launcher for my parachute in Scrappy. So right now, I've taken a bunch of these aluminum shims I machined up until I got a two inch spacer. And what I've got to do is inside here, and I'm kind of point real quick, you can see this rocket, and the rocket will launch out the top. This red rocket will go through the top of that cutaway that I have on top of the airplane. What I have to do is the rocket, when you first launch it, you want it to gain some momentum. When the explosion first goes off, it breaks three little plastic screws that are holding the rocket down so it doesn't vibrate around in all your normal flying. That explosion will break those and start coming out of the rocket launching tube. And you need to have at least two inches, which is that, for the rocket to gain a little momentum as it starts to come out of the tube before it makes its first crushing impact on the explosion, designed explosion top off the aircraft. So this is my two inch spacer. Now, the aircraft is rounded and it's compound rounded. It's sloped downhill this way and an arc. If that rocket were to hit that arc of the roof, that rocket, as soon as it tried to blow the top off, would hit this arcing shape and the rocket would come up and deflect sideways, it may not even get all the way out of the aircraft. And if it did, it would turn the rocket sideways. We want that rocket to go perfectly straight. So this funny little foam thing is the design for the mold to make the impact part of my explosion design top of the aircraft to come off. So the rocket would come up and hit a perfectly flat surface, not tip the rocket one way or the other. And then this cable assembly slides down onto the rocket. I'll put that on later. And that will explode. And I'm gonna put a fracture line right through this joint right here and another fracture line right here. And that's designed so that the rocket first hits this flat spot, keeps the rocket straight, snaps that off out of the way rocket gains momentum, then these cables will pull across, rip this section off, parting at this line. That's where the parachute goes all the way out. And there is a painted trim that goes the rest of the way up and it would rip these out that painted trim and hang from right there. So all my connection points, the big half inch pass-through bolt on a big C-channel subframe I made, I put big rounded radius edges everywhere this cable could pull against so there'd be no sharp edges to cut it if maybe the plane was tumbling when I had to pull the chute and it pulled sideways was the load instead of straight back up top. So really tried to cover all the bases. Even if you look inside here, the parachute box I made, um, a lot of them don't have this big radius edge on it because the straps are so strong. Um, it's usually not a problem, but I put this big arcing radius around all the corners. So as the parachute drags out of the box, if it drags sideways, it can just come around a big rounded edge and never 
hook up on the aircraft. So this is just a, if you look right here, not for flight, <laughs> ground ejection test. So that's what's coming up. We're gonna launch a not for use parachute, test it. If it's good, I'll take the other one of these I have that's painted, we'll install the parachute and this, the permanent ones, and may they never ever come out. Okay guys, so right now I'm taking a break from Scrappy to kind of work on Scrappy. We're prepping the best tugs. So for those of you who don't know, the logo that's on all my shirts doesn't always say best tugs. We build aircraft moving equipment from small to large aircraft, whole bunch of sizes, remote control and, and walk behind or stand on, ride on tugs for moving airplanes or trailers, boats, things like that. So. This is the paint I'm doing that matches Scrappy's paint. So I just got the black on, and now I'm gonna put silver, orange, then mix it up with the Best Tugs logo and Scrappy on here. Because of course, you gotta have a tug to move Scrappy out to do a rocket launch for my parachute test. So I'm gonna hurry and get my tug done. So at least the tug moving the plane for the rocket launch matches. That's the goal. Let's get back to work. I'm gonna bubble wrap Scrappy. <laughs> so I'm launching a rocket out of Scrappy on this video, which is so cool and scary because I don't want a part to come down and hit the plane. So we're gonna work on that. I'm gonna time lapse. We're gonna put bubble wrap this thing up and protect it. The coolest part about today's video is so much cooler than launching a rocket. And it's, I finally talked my best friend ever, who does every single build with me to get on this side of the camera. So I get to introduce him, and I, I'm, I can't say enough great about this guy and my third helper. So there's three of us, I'm gonna introduce you to him right now, that are the last mountain of builds, all the way from 36XX, my cross country record setter, racer, turbulence, the fastest single turbo prop, Draco, Scrappy, other aircraft. It's been this team. So one of them you've seen sneak into the camera now and then, it's this little guy. This is one of our team, this is Scrappy. He's a little shy, but if you randomly are watching me do a video and then I just start chuckling, well, I kind of do that anyway, but. Sometimes I'll just start laughing right in the middle of a sentence. Um, that's usually because this scrappy little guy is doing some pose behind the camera to distract me. And uh, <laughs> so I, I, I won't tell you all the things he's done, but he hangs from chains. He's always doing something random. He keeps us smiling all the time. So that's one. 95% of everything you've seen on all my videos is two guys and this little guy, three guys. And that's Ron, who has been a friend for 20 years now. And uh, I wanna introduce him. He's been our Darth Vader on the other side of the camera. 
<laughs> Welcome to Ron. I finally got him uh, to agree to get on this side of the camera. So if you're wondering why this guy occasionally does the Darth Vader noises in the background, <laughs> it's because usually we'll be sanding, cutting, grinding, making a big old mess. And right while we're still huffing and puffing, I'll be like, Ron, grab the camera. Let's do a little bit of footage. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Ron. Um, 20 years ago, I met him. We did a few projects together. About 12 years ago, he left and had to spend some time in the Taft Correctional Facility in prison. Ow! Get your ass to jail! Ow! 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 And uh, I missed him a lot. And so I would fly my racer. This is before Ron started doing aircraft with me. I'd fly my racer to Taft, California every month and go visit this guy. And since Taft California Airport is a little airport in an even littler town, no taxis, no Ubers, of course that didn't exist then, no rental cars. So to go visit this guy, I bought a mountain bike. I chain locked it to the fence at an airport. I would fly my plane in, unlock the bike, pump up the flat tires every month, and ride out to see this guy in Taft. All the years I went to visit my friend in California, Taft is inland, on the other side of the range where there's normally fog. I had never flown to Taft and had fog. And on release day, he has a set day, a set time, and somebody has to pick him up to take him to the halfway house. I got to be that guy, and so I jump in my plane, and I fly there, and what do you know? The only time in all those years there was fog scheduled to be lifted, didn't lift. It was sucked in, and I'm just going, what on earth am I gonna do? The fog never rolled out, the runway's right there, there's no town close enough, and if I don't get this guy, he's not coming home. Like, that clock is out, they lock him back up, so I remember flying low right on top of the cloud layer, VFR, and getting on the phone and calling around and finding someone at the airport to get in a car who'd never met this guy <laughs> and have him go pick him up while I went to find a landing spot. So I found a landing spot on top of a mountain that was adequate in a hot rod, Reno race style Lance Air Legacy. Well, I'm just, I'm just waiting and there's a guy that come, just says, are you Ron Clark? I'm like, yeah, he's like, get in the car. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And he's like, we're gonna take you where Mike's at. He's, he's got here, he's safe. He's, he's gonna take you and pick you up and take you home. <laughs> so Ron's waiting for me, who I can't talk to, can't call. No phone. They, no phone, no way to call him. He's just sitting <laughs> at a door. With a, with a guy that has to see him get picked up by somebody with a box. <laughs> and then a car with a guy he doesn't know is there, not me. So anyway, we got him on a plane and we got him, we got him home. So I said, well, here's keys to a truck. I got this hangar, I got an apartment in it. And uh, that very first day we went out and we went shopping mm -hmm. for clothes. Mm -hmm. Like, yep. <laughs> I don't really do that. <laughs> I said, well, Ron, I, if you don't know what you want to do, I'm, I like to build airplanes, you know that. Do you want to help me build my plane? So, I don't know, that was about 10 years ago. I really don't know tools or how to build, but I'm a good worker, and I said, awesome. And on the very first day, I'm like, hey, could you grab me a Crescent wrench? And he walks over and he looks at, looks at this wall of wrenches, and he look, turns back and goes, what's a Crescent wrench? <laughs> and I was like, oh. <laughs> so, and what's unbelievable, is this guy instantly learned everything and is the hardest, fastest worker you'll ever meet. And we kind of just evolved together. And I'm, I don't know how to describe Ron and do it justice other than I love the guy and he's the greatest guy I know, period. I would do anything for this guy. Same. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> But we learned to work together in a way that I will dive into a project and I am telling you what, this is no joke. I will be working and in a zone and all of a sudden 
everything's turning up right by me. Boom, this, that, that. He thinks further ahead than I am when I'm in a zone and all of a sudden I go, I need a, and it's there. Or I need, and it got, this is gonna sound crazy. This is no joke. I will be on the other side of the shop and I'll turn and as I say, I need, and I look up, there is a wrench coming through the air. This is not a joke. He literally walked over because he knew I was going to need a 7 16 inch wrench. And he walked over and as he's walking over, he grabs the wrench and he's bringing it back and he sees me turning my head. I need a, and he chucks it. If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Oh. <laughs> and that's how we get like, there's no walking. I mean, it's, it's running back and forth, throwing, rolls the tape or flying across the shop. And, uh, you know, he, he does a really good job just keeping everything just moving. So well, let me tell you, I, I love hate this guy. I mean, first of all, <laughs> I'm a morning person. He's a nighttime person. You know, I mean, he's, he's 24 seven most of the time. You know, I check out at about noon or about midnight, two o'clock in the morning, I'm out. I just leave. But then I'll, I'll come back the next morning and they were like a bomb went off. Cause he's kept, you know, he stayed up all night. So I get up at six o'clock every morning and I come in and clean everything up and see what he's done and just, there goes the day. We, we, I started naming my hanger the magic hanger because I, when I, we started to get into this groove and he'd check out as the, as the clock switched to the AM or whatever time. And I've got, I just, I have this drive to finish whatever project I'm on. I just want it done. And so he checks out. And we learned that we get a lot done if I just stay in the zone. Meaning if I pick up a wrench and I'm working, I drop it. If I'm doing carbon fiber and I peel the plastic off, I drop it. I am a nightmare. I mean, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I am a night. I just, it's just go, 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 go. And we learned that if I can do that, and I don't walk across the shop and I don't waste any time and every single second is as fast as I can go to finish the job. And then, you know, the sun starts sneaking up and I drop the tools and the part or the project is done. I'll go back, I'll get a few hours sleep and then magic hanger happens. <laughs> because I show back up at eight o'clock, nine o'clock the next day and uh, the place is, Immaculate. Every tool is put away, everything's done, parts are cleaned up, floor is swept, and Ron's here with a great big giant smile, being a super awesome morning person, and we dive into it again. So I love this guy. If I didn't have this guy, I think they would be, I don't know if I could build another airplane. You're going nowhere. Let me tell you, I love this guy. He, you know, you, you see who he is on camera. He's more than that. He, he is the most giving, loving, you know, makes you work hard. <laughs> I would, <clears throat> I would do anything for this guy. You know, he, he's helped me out and, and I'll be here till we're done. And I'm sure there's more, you know, I mean, he keeps coming up with projects. I just want to keep going to the lake, but then he comes up with another project and here we are. So, but thank you. I love you. I love so, you, buddy. You're awesome. <laughs> anyway, I guys, I hope all you guys find your Ron out there because I'm the luckiest guy on earth, so. Here is the team. 95% of every inch of everything is <laughs> this team. This is, the, this is the little band. And uh, what are we gonna do now? Let's wrap the plane. We're gonna get back to work. Back to work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, so while we've got Ron agreeing to be on camera today, I don't know how long it's gonna last. We're gonna try something different. I'm gonna flip the camera around. Ron's gonna tell us what we're gonna do, so hold on. All right, so we're gonna shoot a rocket off out of this thing, so what do we have to do? <laughs> Protect it. Bubble wrap, <laughs> stretchy stuff, blankets, and a lot of work and tape. So we're gonna, we're gonna go from here, back right now, and get this thing wrapped up and protected. So you know, you, you know what Mike says, back to work. <laughs> All right, guys, 
I don't know what time it is. It's getting late. We're going to get up at 530 in the morning and launch a rocket. So we're making a big mess. We're still bubble wrapping the plane, but we just installed the rocket and it is now live. So we've got it pinned and safe because this little red guy right here is gonna come out of there in a fraction of a second. So I'm really excited. I gotta finish bubble wrapping. I'm gonna bond this down. Um, right now I'm just getting foil tape, but I'm actually gonna bond it the way it will permanently be bonded. It'll dry overnight. Then I'm gonna put a film over top, like a clear bra that will just keep uh, the seam line uh, clean. So that's gotta go on. So I'm gonna mimic an actual finished aircraft so that the test is valid. So if all goes good, we're gonna have one millisecond of fun and then we're gonna clean up a little mess. <laughs> so we got a lot to do. Let's get back to work. Hey guys, all right. So I'm actually, <laughs> I'm excited and I'm really, really nervous. So I just spent about two hours with BRS um, the day before I'm supposed to launch this rocket, watching rocket launch test failures. Rocket launches that go bad. And you know what, I know I've engineered this and I've done everything to spec and uh, I was feeling really good about it. And um, I tell you what, I watch these videos and I'm not gonna use any names, but there's some aircraft manufacturers, big ones, that I really look up to. And I watch these rocket launch tests come out of these airframes and the entire airframe implode in itself and move 16, 18 inches and more. One of them moved almost three feet. The whole airframe rippled out and broke. And I, I was blown away, I mean, big companies. And it wasn't just one big company, it was one after another after another. And that's why we do this test. So let me tell you why this happens. And it seems like no big deal when I'm just doing it on paper. I'll try and describe it the best I can and why I'm nervous before this launch. When this rocket goes off, it produces and this is not gonna sound like a big number, but it is. It produces over 2,000 pounds of impact thrust on the initial launch. A 2,000 pounds, big deal. I built the plane to handle so much more than that, suspension and everything else. Here's the problem that makes the calculations difficult. It is two, over 2,000 pounds in tenths, not tenths, sorry, hundredths of a second. It is a shockload impact that happens now and everything around it just lets go. So I knew that designing it. And so I built in a subframe, a carbon fiber frame, an absorption area, tied it into the main truss web that went all the way to the tail, all the way to the front. So that shockload explosion, it's literally an explosion that's gonna go off in my airplane. <laughs> that's already painted. This is the best bad idea we have, sir, by far. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's unbelievably destructive, but it needs to be to be able to blow a top off an airplane. So watching these videos and watching big companies' planes ripple and move a shockwave making composite airframes wave from front to back of the airplane, uh, I'm a bit nervous. So this is why we do the test. We don't want to find out in the air. I'm gonna pull a handle and hope I don't destroy Scrappy. So, uh, shock loads. So after the 2,000 pound impact, now then it's easy. That shock load happens, then that rocket will continue a load that's just a couple hundred pounds. And uh, that's supposed to first explode, blow the top, and then carry and be able to lift roughly a 70 pound pack and straps and everything with it and gain airspeed going up. So now you got hundreds of pounds of lift um, that's gonna carry up. So that part doesn't make me nervous. The impact on the straps when that rocket reaches the end does not make me nervous at all. Those are way overbuilt, but I'm scared to death 
of the shock load impact of an actual explosion going on. So the other thing that's really interesting, there's gonna be a fireball in this aircraft, a large fireball. And um, we got cameras, we're gonna put them inside, outside, all over the place. But what's really amazing, and I've watched videos on this, is that the fireball can't light anything. Just as quick in hundreds or thousands of a second, this explosion happens, the fire goes and it's gone. It's so fast that during testing, they actually piled up different kinds of animal hair, human hair, thin strands of other materials, anything combustible they could put directly under the rocket launch. Imagine taking your hand and just waving it through a fire. If you move your hand fast enough, I don't care how big that fire is, you just go through it. If you can move your hand fast enough, you don't even feel the heat. So that's what happens with, when this explosion goes off. It will put out a fireball, but if you don't have a high-speed camera, you won't even capture the explosion itself. It would just look like nothing happened. But if you slow it way down, you might capture one or two frames of a flash and gone. Not enough to create a measurable heat on the inside of the airplane. That's why these airplanes don't start on fire when the rockets go off. So I'm not worried about the fire. I'm not worried about the flash. I'm extremely worried about the instant explosion. So <laughs> this is a scary test but let's get it done. All right, it's rocket launch day. We're gonna blow the top off Scrappy. This is so So here's the plan. We came out here just before the sun comes up. In just a couple minutes, the airport will officially be closed. So I'm nervous because <laughs> I'm actually gonna climb in there and pull the handle, which is so cool. So it's a long time coming. I've never launched a rocket like this. May this be the only time in my life I pull this handle. <laughs> But if it's not, I'm really excited that I'll have the option if I have to. So, minutes away from countdown. <laughs> Let's get to work. All right guys, we're gonna do a quick walk around. We're setting up cameras. We're getting one right down here that is gonna shoot up right at the rocket. We got one pointed at my face inside that will point when I pull it. So you'll get to see me scared. <laughs> then we got one coming back here. We got another one on top of the ladder up there. Looks like I might throw some more tape on it. We got one shooting down on top of it. We're gonna put another camera on the floor pointed at the sky. If everything goes well, that's where it should be. Scrappy, you ready for this, buddy? Cameras are all on. Five, four, three, two, one.
<laughs> that actually put off a really cool shockwave. The whole plane, you can feel it. I haven't heard how it went yet. Did it go good? Did it launch right? Woo! I am so pumped. So the whole plane, you feel it heave. I left the back open so it would be the natural effect of what kind of smoke I'd get in the cockpit. Just enough, I coughed about four or five times. Smoke cleared out. That was so cool. That's gotta be one of the coolest things I've ever done with an airplane on the ground. Now I'm not sure you can call it an airplane. There's no wings on it, but now I can pop some bubbles. I've been wanting to do it. <laughs> Scrappy, how you doing, buddy? Is that cool? He got the real up close and personal look. <laughs> this was the most critical part. This was supposed to come off all by itself. Rocket hit here was first impact, sent it out of the way. It gave room for a clear path out of the plane. That's when it pulled, gained speed, put the steel cables against the secondary pad, ripped it off, pulled the chute out, then drug the straps all the way out. So. Perfect, the straps are out the top, if you look. Came out clean, parachute came out. Now the parachute stays tied up. This is just a test parachute. If you notice, it's been about how five to 12 knots maybe. And you always worry during a test, especially a plane without an engine on the front because it's extra light and it's a cub, that if the parachute actually was allowed to open and we've got it tied off so it just stays in a neck. So in the video, it shouldn't have opened. I'm sure it didn't, but it's kept tight. So the right now as this wind's picking up, that's probably now 10 to 15. That chute wouldn't open up and drag my plane across the weeds. So we're gonna take all this bubble wrap off, stomp on it all day, pop bubbles for the rest of the day, and then we're gonna get back to work. He so, he so right here, if you look at these, where all the stitching is torn, this is the area where as it pulls, it's, it starts snapping apart and tearing the stitches. And that's what lengthens the rope and slows down the speed that can be anywhere from two to 400 kilometers an hour of that rocket. And then it hits all at once and it would just break everything. So these stitches, start snapping and unfolding this all the way out and you can see it got all the way down to the last few stitches which is perfect because it left just a little bit if it went all the way um, you might have got a little more stress so this just kept going until it was nice and even and stopped so that is so cool that is a perfect launch <laughs> this is really cool if you look right here, when I was installing it, these little bolts are just plastic. And that's what holds it tight to the plane all the years you fly it. But if the rocket goes off, you can see real close, it just rips them out and then burns. That has actually burned the edges from the actual fire coming out of it. You can see a little bit of burn on these cables not enough to get it warm enough to even go through the protective plastic shield. It's kind of cold this morning. This thing is still really warm and it's been about 15 minutes since we launched. So DRS, we love you guys. Thanks for saving over 400 confirmed lives and many more of the people that called in wrote letters saying that they got in a bad situation, got the airplane in trouble, stalled, turning, and it gave them a little bit of comfort to spend a moment, straighten the plane out and fly away because they were confident in their mind that if they couldn't get recovered, they could pull it. And it 
gave them a little bit more confidence to save the aircraft and not pull the chute. So it's something I hadn't thought about. And then I started talking more to people that have experienced it. And uh, we know of over 400 lives saved that they would have crashed into the trees, impacted. Um, but it's more than that. It's just that peace of mind gives you a little bit more time to try and recover the aircraft. Of course, that's only if you got altitude and you're not gaining airspeed and running away from its uh, top speed limit. But man, I am so pumped this is in the plane. So we're gonna put it back in and then leave it there. <laughs> hey guys, we just got the plane back in. So I'm here with Adrian who came in yesterday to make sure that uh, I didn't shoot myself with a rocket. And uh, Adrian, what'd you think? The installation was perfect, you know. He, they, he took care about all the small details of the, of the installation. Um, the test this morning, it was fantastic. Everything that the, that need to uh, be working in what uh, direction it was working on that sense. Um, Everything was like music, so rocket went out, parachute was fully extended, uh, the harness was full deployed, so everything was like great. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you coming out. It was like music, that's all I, that's all I care, it was like music. Thank you so much, yeah. I appreciate you guys. Let's get to work. <laughs>